Hey there. Now one of the things that ice anglers and kayak anglers have in common is that we have to find a way to power our fish finders uh, when we're out on the water or on the ice. Um, so for example here I have my Helix uh, 7 ice fishing sonar and in the back I have to carry around my battery pack inside here. And for most of us, uh, we're using small, portable, either lithium or seal lead acid batteries. Uh, but this is something that we have to consider uh, when we're planning trips and when we're buying uh, our sonars and our batteries is just how much power do these things use and what can we expect out of performance of our batteries in terms of longevity when we're out there fishing. Because there's really nothing worse than getting out there and this screen goes black and you try and power back on and then you realize that you either forgot to charge your batteries or didn't fully charge your batteries and you just feel completely blind when you're out there. So today I thought I'd go over some of the power consumption rates of the more common entry level uh, fish finders from Garmin, the Rants, and Hummingbird. And then I talk a little bit about sealed lead acid versus lithium batteries in terms of expectations of how many hours you might get out of your different sonar units depending on which unit you buy and what size battery you have. And then I also want to touch on a little bit of my experiences of using this theoretical data which is provided by the manufacturers versus real world applications in say summertime temperatures versus wintertime temperatures. So let's get started. So one thing I think that not a lot of anglers take into account when they're making a purchase of their fish finders for ice fishing and for kayak fishing is just how much power consumption uh, they're gonna have to deal with depending on what model they buy. And the major driver in this is going to be screen size. So for example, the Garmin Striker 4, um, which is a very popular entry level uh, fish finder for both kayak and ice anglers, only draws about 0.23 amps per hour. Now that unit comes with sonar and GPS. If you look at Hummingbird's Piranha Max 4 series, uh, that's just basically just sonar or just down imaging. It draws even less at 0.18 amps. So that addition of a GPS does add a little bit of power draw, but not a substantial amount. Lowrance doesn't actually produce a entry level four inch sonar anymore. Um, so really Garmin's the dominant one here because they have one that comes with sonar and GPS. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw up on the screen here a chart that's gonna go through all of these so that you can follow along a little bit easier. But these are just the manufacturer's supplied numbers in terms of what the estimated draw is for these different units. If we jump up into screen sizes of five inches and greater, you'll see that the Garmin Striker uh, 5 clear view, so that's their down imaging plus sonar, chirp sonar, and GPS is gonna draw about 0.4 amps. The Helix 5 goes up a little bit more at 0.65 amps per hour. And the Reveal 5 from Lowrance is very power hungry at 0.9 amps. We go up again into the seven inch screen size and we got 0.55 amps for the Striker 7. The Helix 7 has 0.8 amps, so they're pretty similar. And again, the Reveal 5 from Lowrance is really pushing it up there at 1.25 amps. I've also thrown the Echo Map uh, seven inch in here too from Garmin. And what's interesting about this one is it really depends on what uh, transducer you're running with it. There's a lot of transducer options from Garmin. If you're running the G752 transducer, which is their side imaging and down imaging transducer, it is a nine watt transducer. Uh, it is 0.8 amps per hour uh, on the seven inch screen. But interestingly, if you run just their clear view, the CV52, uh, it actually jumps way up to 1.25 amps. So you actually draw way more power and get less features. So you really need to be aware of just what transducer you are also using because it may severely impact the longevity of your battery um, when you're out there on the water for the day. So if you've done any kind of research on 
lithium iron phosphate batteries versus steel lead acid batteries. You've probably seen some kind of graphic like this which shows the difference between these two batteries and their voltage um, over their discharge. And you know, the major takeaway here is that lithium iron phosphate batteries are able to maintain a higher voltage deeper into their discharge than sealed lead acid batteries. And a lot of people like to really emphasize that, you know, if you're running anything on a 12 volt system, the real advantage of lithium iron phosphate batteries is that, especially for fish finders, is that you won't drop below that 12 voltage mark um, and have your electronics shut off on you uh, as you use up the battery as quickly as you would with a lithium iron phosphate battery. So a lot of them will hypothetically say that you know a sealed lead acid battery you can really only discharge it you know 40 to 60 percent of its the depth of its discharge and then you're going to drop below the 12 volt uh, voltage and that is in fact generally true but the problem with fish finders or at least using that or using that as a major reason to upgrade your batteries is that many fish finders are actually able to operate at much lower voltages so for example the hummingbird helix and the rant systems are designed to work down to 10.8 volts and the uh, Garmin Echoes are actually designed to work down to nine volts. Um, now, if you have a Striker series, then yes, 12 volts is the cutoff line. So it's really gonna depend on what fish finder you have and what type of battery you have and how many amp hours you have on your battery that are gonna help you determine uh, how long you can be out on the water because there's a lot of variables going on there that you have to take into, into account. Uh, so from my experience, um, because I primarily use Helix units and real world trials, like with my Helix 5, I'm able to actually extract uh, way more hours than I theoretically could based on say uh, only a 50 percent discharge rate dropping below the voltage and that's just because helixes can run on lower voltages than say a striker can and so in reality with a seven amp hour battery i'm getting 15 hours out on the water when in, theoretically i should be getting far less so it's really going to vary depending on your experiences i think actually a bigger reason why i think lithium iron phosphate is a better way to go is just because it's a better value because you get far more cycles out of an individual battery, you know, two to three times as many cycles than you would out of sealed lead acid. And you also get that weight advantage, which is a big deal for both kayak anglers and ice anglers alike to not be hauling around a heavy battery. And you're just going to get a longer lifespan out of the lithium. I think those are far better selling points than just the voltage issue. But let's get back to the second question, which is how long am I going to be able to stay out on the water or ice? if I have these different fish finders based on their uh, amperage draw. And that's a pretty easy math problem to do, at least theoretically. Um, so this is my 10 amp hour Dakota lithium battery. And in theory, I should be able to run this to almost uh, zero discharge. Now that's not actually possible, but I can get darn close. And that's because these batteries put out a sufficient amount of voltage that I'm able to run them down to nearly full discharge. So all I've got to do is a little bit of simple math here. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw that graphic up here for you so you can follow along. And all I'm doing is some simple math here. So I'm taking 10 amp hours, because I have a 10 amp hour battery, and dividing it by the amps per hour that is reported by the manufacturer. And what you're seeing is that, you know, it really does make a big difference in terms of your screen size of how many hours you're gonna get out on the water. And this is really under optimal conditions and if they are actually reporting truthful numbers on these, which I'll talk about in a sec. But you know, with the smaller Garmin Striker 4 and Piranha Max, you're gonna get 40 to 50 hours out on the water or ice, which is phenomenal. That's a week's worth of fishing. Um, Additionally, with the Garmin uh, 5, Striker 5, you're going to get about 25 hours. So, you know, that's two or three solid days, long days out on the water or ice. The Hummingbird Helix, 15 hours, and the Lalance Reveal, 11 hours. When you started getting into these 7-inch screens, 
um, you'll see that your number of hours out on the water ice is really depleted. You're anywhere from 18 down to 8, depending on what model that you're using and manufacturer. And this is why, you know, I've, I've never really understood why folks want to use 9-inch screens or bigger um, when they're out ice fishing or kayak fishing is that your power needs start just to get crazy beyond that, which is why I didn't include them in here. Because basically, you're going to have to be carrying a 20 amp hour battery or more just to power your stuff for a full day, a long day on the water. Unless you just spend really short days out up there. But I tend to be an angler that spends, you know, 6 to 12 hours out on the ice or water on an average day when I get out there. But there's a bit of a catch here. And that is, in my experience, um, running both lithium and sealed lead acid batteries... I'm getting far better outcomes than I should be based on what the manufacturers are reporting. And that's true for, like I said, both sealed lead acid and lithium batteries. And what I found is that there's a lot of ways that you can improve your battery life outcomes while you're out there uh, off of a single charge, depending on how you use your fish finder. Um, so I'm talking about the different settings. I'm also talking about what transducers you use, and I'm also talking about ambient air temperature. So like I've shown in my previous uh, videos, is that um, I actually saw less declines in performance with sealed lead acid versus lithium batteries. Actually, lithium actually showed more detrimental impacts on its output in colder weather than sealed lead acid did, although those differences were actually fairly small. It still surprised me. So that's a future video that I want to cover, but I did want to encourage folks when they're shopping for fish finders to think about uh, your screen size, to dig into the data from the manufacturers, to think about, you know, how much battery do I want to carry out there? What are my battery needs in terms of, am I sort of a half day fisherman? If, am I a full day angler? Or am I somebody who likes to go on multi-day trips? You really got to take that into account when buying your fish finder or buying your batteries for your fish finders. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. If you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, fish smarter, not harder. Bye, guys.